There we recording. But welcome back to our one o'clock panel. Um, this panel is Show Baraka. Uh, he is a graduate of Tuskegee University and the University, or he went to Tuskegee University and the University of North Texas, where he studied television, film, anthropology, and public administration. He has spent the last 14 years traveling the world as a recording artist, performer, and cultural curator. His overseas work has ranged from leading seminars about race relations in South Africa to establishing artist hubs in Indonesia. Whether he's in the classroom as a professor, he has taught um, college classes, I forgot exactly where. On stage as an artist, in the streets as an activist, or in the boardroom as a consultant, he is combining his artistic platform with his academic pursuits to contribute a unique perspective in multiple arenas while attempting to uplift, uplift the culture. He's the co-founder of Fourth District and the Ann Campaign, and he was an adjunct professor, here's the information, at Wake Forest uh, School of Divinity, as well as an original member of the internationally known hip hop group consortium, um, the 116 Click, uh, and, record, and record label Reach Records. He has a book coming out in May, I believe, but spring 2021, he saw that it was good. He lives in Atlanta with Patrice, his wife of 17 years, congratulations, and their three children, one daughter and two sons, and he is here, of course, to, to talk to you about art and social justice. So welcome, Show Baraka. I, I mute your mic down there too. Hi, there we go. Hello. Is there an echo? All right. All right, I think that's uh, one, two, mic check, one, two. It's a little interesting setup. So for those who are watching me online, I'm, I'm trying to stay in frame here while also uh, the podium is, is, uh, is, is a little scarce and I have two laptops. So I may do a little bob and weave in here. So just be patient. Um, so thank you, Dr. Touche, for that amazing uh, introduction. I, you made me seem way more studious and and uh, important than I really am, but um, I'll take it all. Thank you guys for um, who are joining online. Thank you who are here in the flesh. I am excited to just to kind of share some of the thoughts that I have around faith and justice. Uh, as he said, there, I have um, done a lot of work when it comes to art. Uh, I became a Christian in college. And so um, naturally, I'm trying to figure out how do I reconcile the things that I believe with the things that I love. And if you're anything like me, that's a goal that you, you yourself are trying to figure out. How do I marry the, the things that I, I am passionate about, the things I do with my hands, but also how do I contribute to the flourishing of society? And the reality of it is, is that no matter who you are out there, no matter what you're doing, you are contributing to either the flourishing or the detriment of society. You are creating something, you are cultivating, and you are telling a story with your work, okay? And uh, you don't have to be a creative to cultivate. The natural fact that you build, that you teach, that you, you're cultivating something, you're creating something, and therefore you are telling a story about what you believe to the world, and that can be beneficial, it can be helpful, or at times it can be detrimental. And I am an artist, I've written many uh, songs. Uh, this is my first actual book. It's a bit of fiction and nonfiction. And so uh, there's a lot of creative elements in art that um, are a lot of creative elements of, of how I like to see the world or how I think the Lord has shaped me and how I use my art. But there's one particular story that I want to start off with that I find fascinating that I think many of you guys are familiar with. And uh, that is the story of Uncle Tom's Cabin. Uh, <clears throat> In uh, 1852, Harriet Beecher Stowe released a fictional slave melodrama, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Miss Stowe finds herself in rare company as an author whose work has literally moved society to a visceral reaction. The book follows the life of a protagonist who is a devout Christian named Tom. His perseverance through peril is nothing short of otherworldly and at times, <laughs> to some people, incomprehensible. Uncle Tom was more than an exceptional character. To some people, he was downright angelic. Stowe's painting of Uncle Tom 
in the pages was effective in snatching the hearts to the plight and the circumstances uh, that he faced. His exceptional character and Christian piety left little for the reader to critique. The reader was introduced to various atrocities of slavery um, and, uh, uh, and the human existence. Stowe's literary technique would challenge the indifference in the anti-slavery Northerners and the sympathetic Southerners who sat in silence, in silent compliance. Um, her work is nothing short of a classic. And uh, many have considered her work a masterpiece and Lincoln himself is uh, claimed is said to have said uh, that her work started the Civil War. Um, but <laughs> like many works that are great, uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin is not absent of critique. And even during that time, uh, the uh, illuminary William Lloyd Garrison wrote in his uh, liberating, uh, liberator periodical, a critique, a strong challenge that I think is very present to today. And, and, and this is where I wanna land, but I'm gonna read this critique first. And I want us to think about how does these, how do these critiques actually weigh up to today's society? So he says, Uncle Tom's character is sketched with po great power and rare religious perception. It triumphantly exemplifies the nature, the tendencies, and the results of Christian non-resistance. We are curious to know whether Ms. Stowe is a believer in the duty of non-resistance for the white man. How is it to be explained or reconciled? Is there one law of submission and non-resistance for the black man and another law of rebellion and conflict for the white man? When it is the whites who are trodden in the dust, does Christ justify them in taking up arms to vindicate their rights? And when it is the blacks who are thus treated, does Christ require them to be patient, harmless, long-suffering, and forgiven? And here's the, the climax. He says, are there two Christ? Now, I want to be fair to Ms. Stowe. Uh, her work was quite pivotal in catalyzing change in America. Um, we can actually say that her book was probably one of the first novels that dealt with white privilege and fragility. Uh, even often used the epithet Uncle Tom, yeah, even the often used epithet Uncle, Uncle Tom has been unfairly marred by, con by contemporary ideologies. If you, if you hear somebody call someone Uncle Tom, that's usually a pejorative, that's a negative thing. But obviously in the book, it was, Uncle Tom was a very noble individual. But the critique is, is that he was so subservient that he didn't see the, the need for his own freedom. And he wasn't willing to go as far to get that freedom as other characters in the book were. And so William Lloyd Garrison is challenging this idea is what, what type of Christ allows other individuals who are white during his time who believe in Jesus to take up arms and vindication for themselves, but ask the black individual to be patient and to be long suffering and wait for glory to come from heaven for their freedom. Um, we have to understand that this is prevalent in our world today. When you speak up and you're speaking up from a perspective of Christian faith, are you speaking from a place of power and autonomy or are you speaking of a place of compassion and conviction and love? And what we witness in this exchange between William Lloyd Garrison and Harry, Harriet Beecher Stowe, Beecher Stowe is not a far cry from the situational application that we find ourselves in many churches today. You'll see that patriots in our society ridicule a football player for kneeling, but then they'll turn around and storm the Capitol when they don't feel like their particular rights are met. You'll have people who care about abortion but do they care about that individual when that individual grows old and they're shot by police officers in the street? We care about sex trafficking, but do we care about the music and the industries that fuel sex trafficking? We care about sending individuals to different countries to do service projects and mission trips, but do we care about the conditions that create those particular situations in those countries, oftentimes that are fed by our own greed and capitalism? We talk about self-care and mental health, but we're constantly in front of our phones. The reality of it is, is that oftentimes we create a religion that is beneficial for us, 
while we demonize the views and the Christ of other people. If your Jesus is simply a political lobbyist for your special interests with the disregards for others, then your Jesus was not crucified, as Reggie Williams, author of Black Jesus and Bonhoeffer, writes about. The reality of it is, is if you believe in Jesus, you must understand that he was a threat to the state. And so in that, we understand that our politics should never lord over our principles. And so the things that we are concerned about aren't about personal autonomy and power. It should be about compassion. It should be about love. And it should be about sacrifice of, uh, for other people. Influence is good, but we should not surrender our ethics and our principles in order to gain influence and access. And sadly, I believe that a lot of our politics today, a lot of Christians have sacrificed their uh, and, and surrendered their ethics and principles in order to win. And this may be a troubling maxim that I'm going to share. I don't think the gospel or Jesus is taught, uh, is commanded us to win, but he has commanded us to love. And oftentimes, winning looks like dying on the cross. Um, and so what does that mean for us in uh, 2021? I think that means a lot of things. One, we must recognize that the world is full of flaws. We have a lot of problems. Um, you know, we have race problems, we have class problems, we have sexism problems, um, and all those things won't be solved immediately. And the beautiful thing about this is that we're human beings and people have various different opinions. No matter if you're black, you're white or whatever, you come from a particular tribe. And even within your particular tribe, whether it be ethnic tribe, national tribe, or cultural tribe, people have different views, varying views on how to address issues. And what we must understand is that we have to have a humble posture. That is quite important for the Christian, is to not assume that everything that they, that they, that they every applied idea that they, that they put to, uh, to feet is absolutely right. Because I feel like we are in no more dangerous, uh, the most dangerous spot when we believe that everything we hold to is absolutely correct. Uh, <clears throat> we understand that the world has a virus and it's called humanity. Our issue is not necessarily just racism. Our issue is that as human beings, we will always find a reason to hate one another. We can look at tribalism. You can go to different countries and it doesn't matter. They can have the same skin. They can look the same. But the fact that you're of a different family or of a different set of, uh, of, 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 of uh, uh, part of the country, people will despise you. We we hate each other because of religion. We hate each other because of eye color. We hate each other because of, of gender. We hate each other uh, because of the language we speak. The reality of it is, is all you need is a neighbor to exercise your hate. And the reality is, is that I believe the gospel and how it is taught teaches us how to surrender ourselves and to love our neighbor in a way that is beautiful. But I think there are a couple of things that I want to talk about and how we get to understanding compassion and conviction. How do we avoid this idea of having two Christ, one that serves my own personal interest of power autonomy uh, that I think has plagued Western Christianity because what we've seen ever since the, uh, the, the, the creation or the, the, uh, the dominance of, 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 of Christianity on this particular continent, it has been nothing short of, of raping, uh, pillaging, and, 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 and overpowering other people who don't have the resources that you have. And this to me is a shame and uh, uh, needs to be rebuked and changed and pivoted in our society because also right now we may not have wars that are religious, but we do it in ideologies and that can lead to some very dangerous things. So the, my first challenge is, first of all, for those in this room who believe the Lord and those watching uh, on uh, Zoom, we must understand that we are to have a gospel that is not of personal autonomy and power. Our gospel message or the gospel that was given to us is not just a message of personal piety, but it is a, it is a, a message of hope for all. There's a personal redemption, there's racial, uh, uh, relational redemption, and then there's operational redemption. When we look at Genesis, what we see is God creating the earth. And then once he creates the earth, he says it is good. And then he creates human beings in his image. 
And after he creates human beings in his image, he said it is good. But then he gives human beings a role and a responsibility. And, these, and, and I believe these, these principles are, are good and healthy, not just for people who believe in Jesus or have a religious uh, preference, but I think these are great principles for anybody who, who believes in civility and charity. God creates the earth, he creates human beings, he creates relationships, and he creates tasks. And for those who don't understand or don't know that well the Bible story, soon after creation, we have a serpent, a serpent who is ear hustling, as we say in certain communities, and convinces Eve and Adam to, 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 to see themselves as God. And the reality of it is, is that is that not our, our main problem within this room? We all want to be God in some way or fashion. We don't want to surrender our own personal preferences for the benefit of other people. And so what we see is an inversion of the economy of God, if you will. And so things that were seen as uh, 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 in right standing to have a relationship with God, to see yourself made an image of God and be satisfied, you're no longer satisfied. To have a relationship with one another that is satisfying, now we manipulate those relationships for our own well-being. But the one thing that I, I see that we hardly talk about within the Christian space, and I think it's quite troubling, is how we create and how we operate. God not only just created us, and he not only created us for relationship, but he created us to do, to create, and to, and to make, and to, and to create systems. And if our relationship with God is flawed, if our image is flawed, and if other people are manipulating our image and our relationships, then that means the things we create also have been flawed. But the beautiful thing about the gospel is many books later, we see an individual named Jesus who comes and he redeems those things that were once manipulated. So those things that were seen as perfect and made in the image of God, Jesus restores it to right order. So being made in his image and a reflection of who God is, we are to live that out in our lives. And so Jesus restores that. So now you are to see yourselves as image bearers, and we are to see one another as image bearers. He also restores relationships between one another. It's not just uh, 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 marital relationships, but human relationships. I am to love you like myself. I am to serve you as possibly as I can. I am to deny my own selfish uh, uh, well-being or my own selfishness for the, benefit of, uh, for the benefit of other people. So he restores individual relationships. He restores human relationships. But lastly... He restores our occupations, our vocations, and the things that we create. So that means he's restoring systems. And it is a responsibility for Christians to restore the evil and wicked systems that cause disparities, that cause marginalizations, and that cause discrimination. And oftentimes what happens is I see too many individuals within particular evangelical movements that see the Christian faith as just something of personal piety. And there's no responsibility to restore or to redeem the work that has gone awry. And so if we realize that our life is not just one of personal piety and it's not just one of, of, of having a, a good relationship with a few and people within our tribe, but it's if we create systems, those systems can be flawed, then we are called to restore and redeem those things. The last two points I would like to make is it is very, it is not, a, oftentimes we hear the, the term reconciliation. And I do think that reconciliation especially, and, I'm, and, I, and, I, and I appreciate Dr. Tush giving me this opportunity to speak from a Christian, uh, to be overtly, uh, to, to come from a posture that is unapologetically Christian because I, I want, I, I, that's, that's the life I live. And I recognize that other people don't live the life that I live, but I also feel that these things are helpful uh, just for charity and civility within our nation. And when we talk about reconciliation, the reality of the Christian life is that we do not have the luxury to not participate in the reconciling of all things. Now, the reality of it is, is that we cannot have reconciliation without truth. And uh, oftentimes our society wants to get to right relationship without dealing with the truth of how we got here. I have been married for 18 years this week, and uh, I am uh, very proud of <laughs> those 18 years. But if I was married for, let's say, 17 years of, those, of, that, of, of this, for 17 years of this wonderful 18 years, if I was very abusive to my wife, 
if I was demeaning to my wife, if I treated her uh, in a way that was uh, degrading. And then all of a sudden on our 18 year anniversary, I said, baby, you know what? Let's be reconciled and let's go ahead and ignore the past and move forward. My wife would look at me like I was crazy. And she'd say, fool, you need some, you need some, you need some help. However, although that seems ri ridiculous, much of our social relationships in the society seems to be managed in the same manner. We look at history and we say, oh, well, that was the past. Let's just move forward and be reconciled. And the reality is, is we have yet to deal with the truth of slavery. We have yet to deal with the truth of Jim Crow. We've yet to deal with the truth of the deconstruction of the reconstruction. We've yet to deal with the truth of the heinous violence that was directed towards people in the Civil Rights Act, a nonviolent movement. We've yet to deal with prison industrial complexes. We yet to deal with a nation that has built its wealth off the backs of slavery and people who they've marginalized. And although there may be arguments that racism is legislatively illegal, the reality is that there are still effects that we feel today that are impacting culture, that are impacting society and communities. And so in order for us to come to a place of reconciliation, we must deal with the truth of how we got here. The, the other thing I would like to talk uh, uh, share is that um, unity doesn't mean uniformity. Oftentimes we want unity, but the reality is, is diversity is beautiful and we must appreciate one another. But oftentimes that appreciation turns into appropriation. How do we learn to love one another without appropriating and forcing one another to be uniformed? Uh, I, I love my white brothers and sisters who I have relationships with. I've um, had dinner at a friend's house and he was like, uh, man, we're going to have uh, meat and cheese and grapes and almonds. And I was like, brother, that don't sound like dinner. That sounds like a lunchable. And when I sat down at his table and I ate, I discovered the glory of a charcuterie board. And I took it back home to my family. I was like, look, I don't know where we've been missing for the last 20 some years, but charcuterie boards are brilliant. They're amazing. They're great. You come by these things through great cultural exchange. And in order for us to have great cultural exchange, we must understand the brilliance and the beauty of diversity. We must understand the beauty of not being colorblind, but to see one another as we are, to celebrate the differences in one another, but not to appropriate it, not to just see one another as performances. Uh, one of my favorite movies to get back on art is Do the Right Thing. And in Do the Right Thing, Spike Lee's movie, Spike Lee plays a character, um, Mookie, uh, and he's talking to, he works in a pizzeria and the pizzeria is owned by an Italian family. And one of the sons of the owner is having a conversation with Spike Lee and Spike Lee is upset and frustrated because the son who is an Italian individual keeps using the N-word. And uh, Spike Lee pulls him aside and he says, Fino, let me ask you a question. He said, who's your favorite basketball player? And Fino says, Michael Jordan. He says, who's your, who's your favorite uh, comedian? He says, Eddie Murphy. He says, who's your favorite uh, rock star? And he says, Prince. And Spike Lee says, all your favorite people are niggas. And you keep using that word in a derogatory sense. And what Spike Lee's getting to is these people are good enough to perform for you. They're good enough to entertain, but you don't see the humanity. In them. You don't see the dignified being in them. And this goes back to what I talk about and seeing individuals as people who are created in the image of God. Are we seeing one another as made in the image of God? Uh, and the last point I would, I would like to make is to, is, is somewhat of a bifurcated <laughs> challenge to those in the room who may consider themselves white and others who consider themselves black. White brothers and sisters in the room, we must understand, or you must understand that racism is your problem. Racism is your disease. I love Toni Morrison. She is one of my favorite, not only just writers, but thinkers. And she has this, this statement and she says, the function of racism is distraction. It keeps you from doing your work. It keeps you from explaining. 
All right, or better yet, it keeps you explaining over and over again, your reason for being. Somebody says you have no language and you spend 20 years proving that you do. Somebody says your head isn't shaped properly and so you have scientists working on the fact that it is. Somebody says that you have no art and you dredge that up. None of that is necessary, she says. There will always be one more thing. The reality of it is, is that this is your mental disease that you have to reckon with. And black people, who find themselves overconsumed with how white people view them will never get anything done. We spend our time always trying to prove our dignity while our own communities are needing great thinkers and great businessmen, businesswomen and, and philosophers and, and preachers and et cetera, et cetera. We never, we often don't get the work done. And then what happens is we find ourselves in the same situation. Now that doesn't mean that we're apathetic about racism. But what that means is, is Oftentimes, we can't continue to, to, to lust for the table of the white society. Oftentimes, we challenge, we keep our eye on the system, but figure out what does it look like to be collaborative to build our own table. And that is part of my desire as an artist and a thinker and et, et cetera, et cetera, is creating space for other individuals who have the same passion of me as me to see people move from the margins to the center. And oftentimes that means not having to chase, I'll say the, the, the ghost of white supremacy around the room, proving that I am a human being. My white brothers and sisters, you, I say to you, just continue to push against racism, push against social injustice, um, but don't always expect for black people to be your coach and your uh, cheerleaders, and uh, because oftentimes it can get exhausting. Um, and so lastly, I'll just say, Jesus is asking us to redeem all things. And it's not just for our own personal benefit. It's not just for our own political expediency. And the reason why I love Jesus is because he is a great example of someone who had all the privilege in the world. Think about an individual who created the world for uh, 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 out of nothing, if you, you know, believe that. But then to come to earth, to die on the cross for people who would shame him. This is a man who wielded his power and his privilege in a way that was beneficial for other people. And we see this theme throughout the scriptures. We see Moses using his power and privilege for other people. We see Esther using her royalty for the benefit of other people. We see Joseph using his power and privilege for the benefit of other people. We see Daniel using his power and privilege for the benefit of other people. And we see Jesus obviously using his God, godliness and his life for the benefit of other people. And so I ask you, how are you using your life and are you using it for the benefit and the service of other people? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah, stay up there for just. Okay. We got. Uh, hopefully, you can hear me. Um, I hear you. So, are there any questions either from the audience or from the or from online? There's so many hands raised right now. It's just I, know. I don't know who to pick from. So hard to choose. I know. I just want to know how much you spent on the cheese board because we spent like 40 bucks <laughs> on one because we're like, that's what we're eating for dinner and then I should box cheese. <laughs> I've, uh, I've done my own charcuterie and it's, uh, they can get pretty pricey. Yeah. They can get pretty pricey. Um, I think the, I don't know if the amount of work that you put into it is worth necessary, <laughs> necessarily the, how you feel once you consume it. But I will say it's tasty. It's a, it's a tasty, it's, it's more, uh, it's not dinner. It's like pre-dinner. Yes. It's like the, the appetizer. Um, but, you know, but I, I'll say this. Uh, another, there are two other great things that I've uh, got. <laughs> and uh, I guess you can say in my cultural exchange with people of a different hue, um, Brussels sprouts. I just, I never grew up eating Brussels sprouts. So I'm hanging around right, white people and Brussels sprouts are now my thing. That's like my jam. Mm -hmm. Um I grew up loving football and basketball. Once I started hanging around white people, I started following soccer. And so, uh, yeah, I watched English Premier League soccer. So, well, um, you're, you're in Atlanta. I'm sure there are a lot of things that. 
I must say uh, you're an Atlanta United fan too, right? Oh yes, I was a season ticket holder before the uh, before the uh, pandemic. Yeah. Okay, so what about him? I was a season ticket holder for the Atlanta United. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, is there something? Mm. Yeah. So you're not a friend of the mustard greens, you're saying? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Got you. Yes. Amen. Um, I'm really happy to see the way young people by virtue of, I think it was even um, theology or religion curator at the African American Museum in Smithsonian. Mm. Um, and Henry Louis Gates' right. uh, PBS series. Yeah. Um, um, it was at the same time that it's happening. Yeah. Um, would you like to speak? Yeah, so one of the things, um, so I, uh, quick kind of like biography, I uh, grew up mostly in a, uh, I guess you can say missionary Baptist church, kind of, you know, backwoods, black church in, in California, Southern California. Um, but I, yeah, there's some country, <laughs> there's some country in California, man. <laughs> there's some country. You can get lost in some of those uh, woods and mountains, so. Um, but I, um, yeah, so I grew up, but I, I when I went to college, um, I, I kind of divorced myself from, uh, because I, I saw it as um, putrid. I saw it as there wasn't much utility for me as someone who was striving to be uh, academically savvy, reach, you know, particular spaces in the marketplace. And I, I saw faith as something that was for weak-minded individuals. Um, however, and I'm not proud of this next, next movement, um, life started to you know, fall apart for me. And then I found myself in white evangelical churches. And one of the things that, I was in, that was endearing to me about white evangelical churches was the academic, the academic aspect of the theo theological study. Um, but one of the things I realized as I was at Tuskegee University during this time is there was a separation between, um, there seemed to be a, a huge disconnect from a God who is Lord of, who is both corporal and cognitive. Like I can, I can love God with my mind, but he has nothing to do with my body, my, 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 my full being. And the more I began to get reunited with the black church and sociologists and thinkers, I realized that the Christian faith from a black faith tradition has always been both cognitive, one that recognized that God is personal and he loves me and he's, he's, he gives me wisdom and he could be quite academic, but he's also very personal in the sense that he cares about my body, he cares about my freedom and liberation. And so therefore it's, black faith has never been separated from justice. Like it's never been, uh, it was never this, this, this bifurcation, if you will. And I find the more I do study uh, or I engage with some of my white brothers and sisters, it, it would behoove them to do more studying of African-American faith so that they can see the connection of what it means to love God, but also have a connection to a society that didn't just uh, preach a gospel of mental liberation, but preached a gospel of physical liberation as well. And so I feel like as I've grown and I've kind of come into this space, it is very important, especially within the last 12 years or 12, uh, about 10 years, um, 
how, what does it look like for the church to recapture that imagination of the civil rights movement? What does it look like for the present day church to recapture that um, movement of both black and white individuals during the abolitionist movements who saw that God was displeased with the way that other Christians were using their religion as a way to suppress people. And I think, although it's not as violent today, it's a violence of a different kind. And we have to be very mindful of how, we, and this is the reason why uh, I am very passionate about preaching a gospel of a, a, a more, I guess you can say a robust theology to individuals that uh, I think follow a, a evangelicalism and I think is very dangerous. And so thank you for that question and kind of giving me an opportunity to kind of rant a little bit. Uh, but yes, I am, I am happy that there, I have contemporaries who are creating social justice movements, people who are activists, people who are, you know, all over the social spectrum trying to figure out what does it look like for me to hold my faith with both conviction, because I'm not going to forfeit what I believe, but also understanding that I don't wield it as a weapon, and I hold it in a compassionate way to serve others. Mm. Right. Mm. And there's a lot more conversation about grief. Yeah. And um, so I think it, it seems like you know, this conversation keeps passion. Even though I, I lead with social justice, part of that, as you were saying, is restoration. Um, and it's not like kumbaya restoration. Right, right. It's that, you know, we have to have this. It's not, it's not just uh, at the ballot box or whatever. It's, it's right. Absolutely. So I think, I think that miss, I was about to say, I want to get to these questions. I think I at least one of the questions on here. Okay. Um, Cause we got a little bit of time. We got two questions, but what Marie was saying leads to really, I think if I heard her correctly, leads to one of the questions that one of our online people asked, which said, can you talk more about how justice is love in action? Which they seem kind yeah, of. Yeah. So I, oftentimes, and <clears throat> oftentimes we talk about, I think it's perfect. Like, yeah, the great transition. We talk about, justice or civility and charity as being something, sometimes people talk about that in a way that's um, docile or um, uh, the very thing, and this, you missed this, I, I, I made a, uh, kind of did a observation of Harry Beecher Stowe's uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin and the critique that William Lloyd Gar Garrison gave it. Oftentimes when we view what what uh, nonviolence or non-resistance is, we view that as weak. But the reality of it is, it's it's love. It's it's we we see. I think now people are finally starting to see King and the civil rights movement as the revolutionaries and the um, agitators that they they were. And then oftentimes, love takes different formations of what it what it means to challenge people. Like love doesn't always mean that I'm in agreement with you. Love can be, my, my, I love my kids. I have three wonderful children and I love them with all my heart, mind, body, and soul. But the reality is, is love is very disciplined. It's, it's very, it's very uh, it can be chastising at times. It can be corrective. And sometimes it can also get violent. Um, because if someone is attacking my wife in the middle of the street and I'm with her, I love my wife. And honestly, I love this individual who's attacking them and I'm going to use violence to stop this act because they're not only, and this is the thing about racism, they're not only offending the, ind the individual that they're targeting their hate towards, they're an offense to themselves because they see themselves more highly than they ought to see themselves. And there's a skewed vision there. And so love has to correct both sides. Love is affirming the individual. It's like seeing the 1968 sanitation worker strike and you see these sanitation workers in Memphis carry these signs that say, I am a man. That's not just 
a, a, a sign of affirmation to themselves, because it is, it's a, it's a declaration saying, I am a man and I've, I must remind myself of my own human value, but it's also telling the world, like, you better see me as God sees me, or you better see me as an individual as I am. And so oftentimes love and action is challenging. It's, it's, it's tough love. It's, it can be, uh, it's, it's many things, but it's not always allowing people to uh, run over you. And the other thing we have to learn about the civil rights movement is those, the, the act of nonviolence is a very strategic thing. They didn't do that just because it was like, oh, we just you know, want to get beat up because we don't want to throw a punch. It was like, no, it's strategic because we'll see, we'll show the world how heinous of an individual you are. And that was brilliant. That was brilliant strategy, I guess you could say, marketing. So, um, yeah. So we have, we have one more question. You ready to go on another rant? <laughs> Um, I All would say it's a Kanye rant, but I don't think it's going to be that. <laughs> um, yeah, sorry, that was a bad joke. <laughs> I know you get it. <clears throat> so I, I got you though. I, yeah, yeah, I know you got me. I got you. <laughs> um, but somebody, somebody says, I'm curious about your thoughts on the relationship between appropriation and music. Um, and then she says, when it comes to hip hop and jazz, uh, thoughts on the way black people and white people meld in those spaces. All right, so I have a real controversial <laughs> view of this. So I would love for people to, <laughs> I, 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 I struggle. All right, so I do believe there's a such thing as appropriation. I believe that wholeheartedly. I do believe that there are, there are ways in which people appropriate. Um, and I, and I, I will say my working definition of appropriation, which could be very off, is that when you take something and you don't give homage to the people who are who are the progenitors of that thing, right? Um, uh, we see that in all types of forms and fashion. We see that in music. We see that in food. We see that in you know um, art, et cetera, et cetera. However, it's it's, it's hard to police. Uh, cultural artifacts, if you will. It's it's it's, it's because the reality of it is, is that the very beauty of who we are, is we're supposed to exchange things as human beings. Like, the, it's, it's a beautiful thing where I see somebody who is white rapping and they're doing it and it's amazing. I'm like, that's great. As long as they don't make it seem like, you know what, this is something that we created and this is ours. But if you're giving honor and, you know, and, and, and praise and, and accolades to the folks who, were the progenitors, I don't see any reason why we should get up in arms. For instance, I, uh, I was reading a, uh, a, like a, a Twitter th a thread from a uh, Korean sister. I, I don't know, I didn't know her. I just, the, the thread kind of took a life of its own. And she was railing against people for like eating bowls and not being Asian. And I was like, well, my Lord, if I can't eat a bowl. <laughs> me too. I'm like, if I can't eat a bowl, then I don't know what to do. Like, cause I love me some bowls. You know what I'm saying? Like, but, um, but I understand what she's probably getting that. Like there are a lot of restaurants that pop up and they take these cultural artifacts and they make it seem as if, no, we, we've created this. Um, now the reality of it is, is anytime a majority culture takes something that they've seen somebody else do, they're going to distribute it to people like themselves. And it's going to, it's going to seem it's probably gonna grow and expand. It's like Sister Rosetta singing blues and rock and roll and then uh, you know, Elvis Presley coming, following behind her, taking this style and then blowing up. Or the style of Chuck Berry and these other folks. Like the reality of it is, is that can be seen as a, a form of appropriation if he doesn't honor who she is. And, and the, other, the other part of appropriation I think that is kind of important is financially, like, are you allowing these people, like, are you exploiting these people? Are you getting rich of off of something without, in some ways, uh, giving recompense, if you will? And I do think that's another, another area of, uh, of reconciliation and appropriation that needs to be thought through. But at the end of the day, I will say that I do believe that we should be exchanging culture, but it's, it can be done in a way that is very dangerous. Thank you. So we're wrapping up um, with Show Baraka and we have Marie Cochran coming up at one. So we have our one last slideshow. So make sure to be back with us then at two. Yeah, so I was like one. I <laughs> Central. <laughs>
Welcome back. We made it to the final presentation at the Monday Dash Sports Session. Jack, thank you so 